So this is extract four from Roald Dahl's Danny, the champion of the world. My father's deep, dark secret. Here I am at the age of nine. This picture was made just before all the excitement started and I didn't have a worry in the world. You will learn as you get older, just as I learned that autumn, that no father is perfect. Grown-ups are complicated creatures, full of quirks and secrets. Some have quirkier quirks and deeper secrets than others. But all of one, including one's own parents, have two or three private habits hidden up their sleeves that would probably make you gasp if you knew about them. The rest of this book is about a most private and secret habit that my father had and about the strange adventures it led us both into. It all started on a Saturday evening. It was the first Saturday of September. Around six o'clock, my father and I had supper together in the caravan as usual, and then I went to bed. My father told me a fine story, kissed me goodnight, and I fell asleep. For some reason, I woke up again during the night. I lay still, listening for the sound of my father's breathing in the bunk above mine. I could hear nothing. He wasn't there. I was certain of that. This meant that he'd gone back to the workshop to finish a job. He often did that just after he tucked me in. I listened for the usual workshop sounds. The little clinking noises of metal against metal or the tap of a hammer. They always comforted me tremendously, those noises in the night, because they told me that my father was close at hand. But on this night, no sound came from the workshop. The filling station was silent. I got out of my bunk and found a box of matches by the sink. I struck one and held it up to the funny old clock that hung on the wall above the kettle. It said, ten past eleven. I went to the door of the caravan. Dad, I said softly. Dad, are you there? No answer. There was a small wooden platform outside the caravan door, about four foot above the ground. I stood on the platform and gazed round me. Dad, I called out. Where are you? Still no answer. In pyjamas and bare feet, I went down the caravan steps and crossed over to the workshop. I switched on the light. The old cars we'd been working on through the day were still there, but not my father. I've already told you that he did not have a car of his own, so there was no question of him having gone for a drive. He wouldn't have done that anyway. I was sure he would never have willingly left me alone in the filling station at night. In which case, I thought, he must have fainted suddenly from some awful illness or, or fallen down and banged his head. I would need a light if I was going to find him. I took the torch from the bench in the workshop, looked in the office. I went around and searched behind the office. I searched behind the workshop. I ran down the field to the lavatory. It was empty. Dad! I shouted into the darkness. Dad, where are you? I ran back to the caravan. I shone the light into his bunk to make absolutely sure that he wasn't there. He wasn't in his bunk. I stood in the dark caravan and for the first time in my life I felt a touch of panic. The filling station was a long way from the nearest farmhouse. I took the blanket from my bunk and put it round my shoulders. Then I went out of the caravan door and sat on the platform with my feet on the top step of the ladder. There was a new moon in the sky and across the road, the big pale field... They deserted in the moonlight. The silence was deathly. I don't know how long I sat there. It may have been one hour, it could have been two, but I never dozed off. I wanted to keep listening all the time. If I listened very carefully, I might hear something that would tell me where he was. Then at last, from far away, I heard the faint tap, tap of footsteps on the floor. The footsteps were coming closer and closer. Tap, 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 tap. Was it him? Was it somebody else? I sat still, watching the road. I couldn't see very far along it. It faded away into a misty, moonlit darkness. Tap, 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 came the footsteps. Then out of the mist, a figure appeared. It was him. I jumped down the steps and ran down the road to meet him. Danny, he cried. What on earth's the matter? 
I thought something terrible had happened to you, I said. He took my hand in his and walked me back to the caravan in silence. Then he tucked me into my bunk. I'm so sorry, he said. I should never have done it, but you, you don't usually wake up, do you? Where did you go, Dad? You must be tired out, he said. I, I'm not a bit tired, but couldn't we light the lamp for a little while? My father put a match to the wick of the lamp hanging from the ceiling, and the little yellow flame sprang up and filled the inside of the caravan with pale light. How about a hot drink, he said. Yes, please. He lit the paraffin burner and put the kettle on to boil. I have decided something, he said. I'm going to let you in on the darkest, deepest secret of my whole life. I was sitting up in my bunk watching my father. You asked me where I'd been, he said. The truth is, I was up in Hazel's Wood. Hazel's Wood, I cried, but that's miles away. Six miles and a half, my father said. I know I shouldn't have gone, and I'm very, very sorry about it, but I had such a powerful yearning. His voice trailed away into nothingness. But why would you want to go all the way up to Hazel's Wood, I asked. He spooned cocoa powder and sugar into two mugs, doing it very slowly and levelling each spoonful as though he were measuring medicine. Do you know what is meant by poaching? he asked. Poaching? Uh, no, 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 really, no. It means going up into the woods in the dead of night and coming back with something for the pot. Poach is another place, poach all sorts of different things, but around here, it's always pheasants. You mean... Stealing them, I said, aghast. We don't look at it that way, my father said. Po poaching is an art. A great poacher is a great artist. Is that actually what you were doing in Hazel's Wood, Dad? Poaching pheasants? I was practising the art, he said. The art of poaching. I was shocked. My own father, a thief. This gentle, lovely man, I, I couldn't believe he'd go creeping around in the woods at night to pinch valuable birds belonging to somebody else. The kettle's boiling, I said. Ah, so it is. He poured the water into the mugs and brought mine over to me. Then he fetched his own and sat with it at the end of my bunk. Your granddad, he said, my own dad, was a magnificent and splendiferous poacher. It was he who taught me all about it. I caught the poaching fever from him when I was ten years old and I've never lost it since. Mind you, in those days just about every man in our village was out in the woods at night poaching pheasants. And they did it not only because they loved the sport, but because they needed food for their families. When I was a boy, times were bad for a lot of people in England. There was very little work to be had anywhere and some families were literally starving. Yet a few miles away in this rich man's wood, thousands of pheasants were being fed like kings twice a day. So can you blame my dad for going out occasionally and coming home with a bird or two for the family to eat? No, I said. No, of course not, but, but we're not starving here, Dad. You missed the point, Daddy boy. You missed the whole point. Poaching is such a fabulous and exciting sport that, that once you start doing it, it gets into your blood and you can't give it up. Just imagine, he said leaping off the bunk and waving his mug in the air. Just imagine for a minute that you're all alone up there in the dark wood and the wood is full of keepers hiding by the trees and the keepers have guns. Guns? I got... No, they don't have guns. All keepers have guns, Danny. It's for the vermin, mostly. The foxes and the stoats and the weasels who go over the pheasants. But they always take a pot of the poacher too if they spot him. Oh, Dad, you're joking. Not at all. But they only do it from behind, only when you're trying to escape. They like to pepper you in the legs at about 50 yards. They can't do that, I cried. They, you, they, they could go to prison for shooting someone. You could go to prison for poaching, my father said. There was a glint and a spark in his eyes now that I'd never seen before. Many's the night when I was a boy, Danny. I'd gone down into the kitchen and saw my old dad lying face down on the table, and mum standing over him, digging the gunshot pellets out of his backside with a potato knife. It's, it's not true, I said, starting to laugh. You don't believe me? Y yes, I, I believe you. Towards the end, he was so covered in tiny, tiny little white scars, it looked exactly like it was snowing. Oh, I don't know why I'm laughing, I said. It's, it's not funny, it's horrible. 
Poacher's Bottom, they used to call it, my father said. And there wasn't a man in the whole village who didn't have a bit of it one way or another. But my dad was a champion. I was a cocoa. It's fine, thank you. If you're hungry, we could have a midnight feast, he said. Oh, could we, Dad? Of course. My father got out the bread tin and the butter and the cheese and started making sandwiches. Let me tell you about this phony pheasant shooting business, he said. First of all, it is only practised by the rich. Only the very rich can afford to rear peasants just for the fu peasants just for the fun of shooting them down when they grow up. These wealthy idiots spend huge sums of money every year buying baby pheasants from pheasant farms and rearing them in pens until they're big enough to be put out into the woods. In the woods, the young birds hang around like flocks of chickens. They're guarded by keepers and fed twice a day on the best corn until they're so fat that they can hardly fly. Then beaters are hired who walk through the woods clapping their hands and making as much noise as they can to drive the half-tamed pheasants toward the half-baked men and their guns. After that, it's bang, 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 and down they come. Would you like a strawberry jam on one of those? Oh, yes, please, I said. I can have one jam and one cheese, but, but, Dad? What? How do you actually catch the pheasants when you're poaching? Do, do you have a gun hidden away somewhere? A gun, he cried, disgusted. Real poachers don't shoot pheasants, Danny. Didn't you know that? You've only got to fire a cat pistol up in those woods and the keepers will all be over you. Then... Then how do you do it? Ah, my father said, and the eyelids drooped over the eyes, veiled and secretive. He spread strawberry jam thickly on a piece of bread, taking his time. These things are big secrets, he said. Very big secrets indeed. But I reckon if my father could tell them to me, then maybe I can tell them to you. Would you like me to do that? Oh, yes, I said. Tell me now.